Okay, guys, uh, second tutorial. This is for the Treaty of Waitangi Standard uh, Question 1.2. What were the different groups of Europeans that had contact with Māori prior to the signing of the treaty? What impacts did these groups have on Māori society? So the first thing you can do, really, is go, right, hmm, the treaty was signed in 1840, so it's those groups, those different groups of Europeans before 1840, who came into regular contact with Māori. So who were they? Um, you have uh, some sections with my notes in the uh, booklet I've given you. So what I've, and if you can read my handwriting, and I know my handwriting is a bit of a challenge at the best of times, but you can see where I've um, added some annotations or notes to help guide you. But I'm just going to hit you now with from, from what I know okay, in terms of who these groups were. So very briefly, what you can do with answering that question is simply identify, say who they were, who were these groups. The first group um, was really easy, the explorers. There were groups, there were different, and, and, and I guess the two best known explorers were Captain Cook and Abel Tasman. Um, and you would say, well, what do you think? How, how big was their contact? Were they in contact with a lot of Māori a lot of the time or a few Māori for a short period of time? What do you think? I think you know what the answer to that might be. The next group of Pākehā, Europeans, who had um, contact um, with Māori were whalers. Okay, so have a look at the section. Um, we'll have a look through those notes for anything about the whalers. So who were the whalers? And I can tell you now there were two types of whalers. There were the blue water whalers. These were the whalers that spent most of their time far out at sea in the middle of the Pacific hunting whales. And then they would come back. They needed to find a place with their boats to um, stock up on supplies, have a bit of shore time, um, get more water, offload barrels of oil if they needed to, and then head back out to hunt more whales. Those are what we call the, the deep water or blue water whalers. And in New Zealand, they tended to... Um, to go to the Bay of Islands, to a place called Kororarika, or Russell, um, and that's where they had a lot of contact with local Māori up there, and that was uh, Ngāpui. Um, the other kind of whaler uh, were shore-based whalers who set up um, bases on shore with a lookout on a high point overlooking the coast, and if they saw whales, because a lot of whales would tend to migrate up past New Zealand, if they saw whales, they would run down, jump it in, into their um, row boats and row out and intercept the whales and try and kill one and then drag it ashore and process it on shore. The shore-based whalers, um, they tended to operate in parts of the South Island, top of the South Island. Now, their contact with Māori was quite sustained because, well, they needed permission from local Māori to, to have their station where it was because that land, guess what, was owned by Māori. Okay, so they had a lot of contact. So that's, that's your whalers. And you could probably throw sealers into that category as well. New Zealand, particularly the South, the South Island, had vast colonies of, colonies of seals, and men would come, uh, mainly men would come and hunt the seals for their skins um, and then take, take them away again. And again, well, they needed permission from Tangata Whenua, from local Māori, to, to have their, their, their sealing, uh, seal hunting camps and to hunt the seals because guess what? that was a resource uh, that was owned by Māori or those Māori in that region and they were living in the uh, rohi or the territory of, of that particular iwi hapu. So they had contact. Um, the other big group um, were traders and these are, when I say big group, probably not big in terms of numbers but a significant group because of the impact they had on Māori. So traders came to New Zealand um, basically looking to make money. They were looking to make money um, trading with um, Māori uh, to get um, their hands on various um, resources uh, and that's tended to be wood, so timber for sail for helping to make and repair sailing boats and flax for making rope because sailing boats were the main, were the only way of travelling internationally around the world um, and for a sailing boat to sail you needed rope, you needed lots and lots of rope Flax was a great resource for making rope, and New Zealand had a lot of it. So um, 
traders are after that. Māori were after what trader traders were prepared to to, to sell them, um, and in return for the wood or the access to cutting cutting wood and and the flax. So you can imagine that Māori saw an opportunity to get new technology, uh, new ideas in terms of growing food, um, new livestock, uh, what new animals to have as livestock. Uh, it made life easier. Tools, metal. Uh, still tools made out of wrought iron these are all really important were seen as being important resources again i'm touching on the impact of traders there um another group were the missionaries and the missionaries came to new zealand because they were all about saving uh saving souls by through conversion converting what uh, maori who they perceived to be um uh i guess uncivilized or savages or the noble savage and it was that they were a part of their mission from God was to, uh, and it wasn't just New Zealand that they visited, but come to New Zealand to to help rescue the souls of these of these people and bring them in, into um, into Christianity and into a more civilized, in their view, in their view, a more civilized way of 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 living. Um, and uh, they set up missionaries established themselves in the bay of islands um 1814 from memory with bishop selvin was the first um notable missionary to to set up in in the far north uh missionaries then spread at various times around parts of new zealand to spread the word but the northland was the first significant point of, of contact for missionizing in new zealand other places where missionaries set up with tauranga um wellington and or in, the, in those in those regions, um, and then lastly you have uh, Pākehā Māori. Now the, this is these were uh, well they came have come to be called Pākehā Māori. These were Europeans who chose to go and live in Māori communities, okay, and um, uh, they acted as they were often intermarry if they were able to, to to survive and not make mistakes which may have led to them being kicked out of the communities and they they acted almost as interpreters links between the Māori world and the Pākehā world so those are the those are different groups of Europeans who had uh, Pākehā who had contact significant contact with Māori before the signing of the treaty my next little video clip will be around their impacts thank you